you got your Bibles, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Now, we haven't had church for two weeks. And uh, it's trying to keep us from having church today. Crazy weather. But I, one interesting thought I thought you would be interested to hear is I get an email from an individual on, on the website. Someone emailed us and was concerned. Why aren't our sermons anymore on the website? Like they didn't know we had hazardous conditions, weather conditions. And um, guess where they were from? Cape Town, South Africa. So, yeah. Well, you, you know, I told you the radio, there was a while there that we had more people listening from Great Britain. And that's rare. I mean, the, usually most of your people that listens to the radio is United States. But there was a trend there for a while that we had more people from Great Britain listening. You know, we have people from Hong Kong, Korea, Germany, France, um, listening to the radio. And of course, if they listen to the radio, we, we advertise our website, which puts them on the website where our sermons are. And that's probably how that transpired there. But I thought that was um, interesting. So we welcome South Africa worshiping with us this morning if he's listening. Anyway, so Ephesians chapter 1. We've been talking about dominion. And I'm going to take a step back because what the Lord's showing me, and there's so many messages that I was telling someone the other day that it would probably take to the midsummer just to suffice me in what, you know, to, to bring it to you all up to this point. But every, every week that goes by, there's more stuff. So they just prolonged it throughout the year. And have taken these two weeks off, this is the last sermon I want to share because I got more stuff. So had we been on time without this bad weather, I could be sharing more relevant stuff to me, the relevant to me, maybe not you. So this, is, this message is two weeks old, and I'm already in summertime messages. And that's really difficult. You may not understand that, but that is very difficult because I'd rather be sharing stuff with you when, it's, when I'm getting it because it's more lively. Um, so this, I've got, I got to blow the dust off of this sermon and share it today. So, so we'll share the one you got. I can't do that because it's line upon line. That'd be like skipping addition and going to multiplication. You're not going to get it. You're not getting multiplication until you understand addition and subtraction. So um, Ephesians chapter 1. Now, we hear the term born again. And I'd really like to hear, I, really, I say I really would like to hear people's definition of what it means to be born again. But then again, I don't think I want to because I don't think they really understand it. And it would just make me sad that we use that term so loosely. And yet, do we really understand the implications of it? Let's put it that way. You may be able to define what it actually means. But do you know the implications of what it means to be born again? So I'm going to, just an introduction, because I think it's necessary to hit that real quick, and then we'll go into what I want to share with you this morning. Born again, and we're going to go to John chapter 3, not literally, because I, you're at Ephesians chapter 1, but in your mind, go to John chapter 3 and think of the story that Jesus is sharing with Nicodemus. And he says to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. Now understand, Nicodemus is a professor, if you will. He's not, an, he's not an idiot. He's not some moron. Or, he's, he's, and he had to come to Jesus at night because of his peers. He didn't want them to know that he was seeking out a little bit more about this Jesus that they were against. So he's like, I, 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 he's a seeker of truth. That's what this tells me. So he's, he's not an idiot. But he, asked, he, he responds, and he has to know this is not what Jesus means. So Jesus says, you must be born again. And he says, what do you mean? Do I go back up in my mother's womb and come back out again? That's ludicrous. I'm almost mad that he even said that. And almost like if you would say that to me, I'd be like, you, please tell me you're kidding. Okay, you, you, you're a smart man. You cannot literally mean 
And he even said, Jesus even came back and said, you're a smart man. You don't know what I'm talking about. So what does it mean to be born again? Because even if a professor, someone of intelligence can't comprehend it, well, you know the average man can't. And you and I couldn't before we got saved. If I would have, someone came up to me and said, what it means to be born again? I'm like, I know what it means to be born. But I have no clue what it means to be born again. What do you, I, I mean, you would have to literally, you would have to go think like him. There's no other way to be born again except go up inside your mother's womb and come out at another time. Let's try this again. Obviously, I screwed up my life in, in, in my 20s, so can I, can I go back up in there and come out again and start this thing over? Get a second shot? That's not. That's stupid. But if you don't have the grid to understand, so Jesus marveled and said, you know, you, you, sh you should know this, but let me share with you what it is. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You have to be born of the spirit. When you came out of your mother's womb, you came out of her flesh. You were born of the flesh. So everything you do in life will originate from the flesh. Up to this point, if your flesh screws up, you have to revert to the same flesh that screws up to fix the flesh. That never works. And, I, and, I've, and I've been using on the radio in the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about Jekyll can't fix Hyde. They're both from the same body, right? I mean, you know, we look at Hyde, I don't know, does anybody really know which is the evil one? I never, I never can figure that out. Is Jekyll the evil one, or is Hyde the evil one? I think Hyde is, because he's Hyde? a doctor. Hyde? Dr. Jekyll, Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. So Hyde's the evil one? Yes. I think so, yeah. Yes. All right, so Jekyll can't stand Hyde. Like you can't stand your, when you bl blow it and screw up, your sins, your, your weaknesses. So Jekyll cannot fix Hyde because Hyde has 50% control. He goes to sleep and Hyde comes up, wakes up, and he goes, terrorizes the town. And he comes back and Jekyll wakes up and goes, what, the, what, what have I done? We don't do that. We screwed up Saturday night, wake up Sunday morning. What did I do? <laughs> Jekyll can't fix Hyde. So that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And Jesus was in essence saying, Nicodemus, you cannot live a life pleasing to God no matter how hard you try because all you're going to be able to bring to God is the tree of knowledge and good and evil you will be able to do good and you'll try to avoid evil but the evil you want to do you end up doing and the good you want to try to do you can't even do that and that's Paul's dilemma in Romans chapter 7 okay so you've got to be born again which means being born of the spirit so this your second birth is when you receive Jesus Christ into your life and you're born anew, born again, born of the Spirit because the Spirit now abides in you. But before you can be born again, there has to be a death. You can't, you can't be born again unless you die. And Romans 6 says when he died on that cross, God took us and put us on that cross with Christ. And just as real as Christ's crucifixion was 2,000 years ago, you have to have your eyes open to your crucifixion was just as real on that cross 2,000 years ago. Even though you wasn't born yet, but when you put your faith in God, God puts you in Christ and all the experiences of Christ now become yours. His death and his resurrection. So Christ dies on the cross. The old man dies. Now, what needs to be born again? What needs to die? Your Adamic nature. You're born in Adam. Romans chapter 5. In Adam, all die. In Christ, being born again, all live. Okay? Eternal life. So does that make sense so far? So we're, we have to die to the Adamic nature because the Adamic nature is of the flesh. That's what you were born out of, humanity. You are born out of humanity or into humanity when you came out of your mother's womb. That's why we're in the trouble that we are in. You're looking to your government to fix all these problems in the Middle East and the Ukraine with Russia. You're looking for your government. They can only do so much. Ultimately, we've got to go to God. And the church really has a big a big piece in this if we would waken up to it. But they have told us that we have to separate church from politics. And it's the church using the dominion that I'm going to be talking about that can really change so much. But we don't know who we are, so creation continues to wait, according to Romans 8, for us to fix it. 
It says creation longs for the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation is the world that, that Adam screwed up. And we perpetually screw up as long as we stay in the flesh. Because the flesh can't fix the flesh. The flesh can't fix the world because the world's carnal, which is flesh. The only answer to this world is the kingdom of God, and that's what we're born of. Born of the Spirit, the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is within each and every one of us. And we live out of that kingdom, and we can start transforming our individual world. And if people come together, we can start transforming this literal world. Does that make sense? So you're born again. Now, to really make this more clearer, Paul takes up on that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and talks about we are a new creation, created in Christ Jesus. Now it says, old things passed away. So when you became born again, that Adamic nature, the way you think, the way you thought, the way you lived, died. It, it passed away. Now you're embracing a new mindset. It's a kingdom mindset, not a worldly mindset. In Ephesians, or Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, I have been crucified into the world, which means there is not a thing in this world I entrust myself in or to any longer. Worldly wisdom, philosophy, ideologies, all these things. And this is what's getting piped down through social media and the news media is all worldly philosophy. Get on Facebook. Forget Fox News and all these other ideologies that are out there. But get on Facebook and listen to the philosophy of people. Worldly. It's not, now some of it's kingdom. Because these people are obviously, obviously saved. Or they were raised in a home. But a lot of the stuff that's getting piped into your smartphone. Or television or internet. Is from the world. And it's a, a, a constant bombardment of all of this worldly information that's coming at us, that's trying, and then what happens is when we receive that, believe it or not, this whole, thi this whole thing about the kingdom is about receiving. Either we're receiving from the kingdom, or we're receiving from all that media out there. And when you receive something, you're renewing your mind on what you're receiving. Unless you're saying, nope, and every time you see something or hear something, you're, nope, that's not God, that ain't kingdom. And you reject it right off the bat. But these people are slick. They just keep throwing stuff at you. And they're building a theology or a mentality or a mindset within you. And before you know it, you're thinking like the world again. And I'm going to tell you something right now. More Christians know what their news media is saying more than what the Bible says. They'll sit themselves in front of the news more than they will the Bible. I know people personally that that I wanted to say to someone the other day, if you had if you looked into the Bible as much as you look into that phone, can you imagine how transformed your life would be? These people can't leave their phone alone. I'm at the I'm at the point lately that it's in my room and it stays there. When I go upstairs to go to the bathroom, I may check my phone. I, it's not on my hip anymore. So if you text me, you call me. I may not respond right away because it's no longer on my hip. It's not my six, what is it, six, six gun. Six gun. Is that what they? Well, that explains, that explains why I shouldn't be holding you. <laughs> Seriously, I'm just, I, 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 I'm, I'm tuning out. I'm tuning out, man. Anyway, so you understand what born again means? I'm a new creation. Old things passed away. I don't want to go and rehash and relive communism. I don't want to go and relive and rehash socialism. I, I, if, if I was a communist, as a born again Christian, passed away. If I was a socialist, born again. Well, how, why? Is it God again? Yeah, because God's about freedom. It was for freedom. Galatians 5.1 that Christ set you free. And no government, any kind of ideology ought to put you in any type of bondage. A true government of God will keep you as free as you can possibly be. That ought to get an amen on that, but that's all right, you know. You don't want your freedom? You understand we're the only country that really has, and we really aren't free, but we are more free than any other country? That's why we came over here is because of the tyranny of Britain for freedom. And now we're, ha we're just with our votes, handing over our freedom again 
I guess we don't like it. I guess we don't want it. I could really take off on this. I really can't. With, new, with net neutrality, we just lost our internet. Three guys. Three guys out of five on the FCC has determined to take over the internet. And when the Congress asked them, let us see, 300 and some pages of this, let us see it, they said no. What entity says no to the Congress? We got three branches to keep us from having a dictator. The judicial, the legislative, and the executive. And they're, it's a, called a balance of power. And they just told our government, the federal government just said to our Congress, no. You lost your internet. Not today, not tomorrow, but in three to five years it will look different. And I may not even be on there. Because I may be a hater. Labeled a hater. Do you not realize anything that the government has taken over, they screw up? Yeah. Alright, but we just did it. We just let it happen. Now, so I, I'm only saying that because obviously we don't like our freedom. Because no one's doing nothing about it. No, half the news media ain't even talking about it. Most of it. But I'm telling you what, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Now that's what we're born again, is to be free from law, free from ty ty tyranny, free from all this stuff. So, now, now that you know what born again means, new creation, old things pass away. I'm, I'm delivered from those mindsets. I'm delivered from those ideologies. I'm a kingdom person now. My only mindset has to be kingdom. And this is exactly what John the Baptist was talking about when he came on the scene. He's called the forerunner of Christ. He comes on the scene. He's born six months before Christ, by the way. It's the cousin of Jesus. And he's preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. And he has a message. What's John the Baptist's message? Repent. It is not John saying repent of your sins. It may include that. It ain't got nothing to do with it. Because if you don't change the way you think, you ain't going to change the way you live. And this repentance is metanoia in the Greek, and it means change the way you think. It doesn't mean quit smoking, quit drinking, quit running around. Repentance means change the way you think. It doesn't mean you got to cry. It doesn't mean you even have to have remorse. Has there ever been times in your life where you've been going a certain way and go, Oh, crap, I've been doing that wrong. And even may giggle about it. <laughs> I've been doing that wrong. This is how you do it. That's repentance. It doesn't have to include tears. Although there's been things I've do been doing wrong that may result in me having some tears and remorse. But it's not necessarily tears and remorse. What John the Baptist was saying was, you got to understand, the kingdom of God is at hand. And the way you used to think, your ideologies, your, the way you see life, your, your philosophies and the law and the Judaism and all these things. He's saying, you've got you to gotta repent from everything you know. Because the kingdom of God is nothing like where you came from. Because when you get born again, old things pass away. And you better take on a kingdom mindset or you're going to be on the outside looking in rather than on the inside looking out. And that's what John the Baptist was trying to do. So guess what? So John the Baptist preaches a, doc, preaches a message of repentance. Jesus comes on the scene and they didn't do what John said. The Pharisees and Sadducees and Jesus bucked heads with them. And they would not bend to the kingdom message and they crucified him. And the rest of the disciples get persecuted by him. Because they will not change the way they think. So that's what it means to be born again. I'm born of the spirit. I'm born of the kingdom, and I've got to change the way I think because now I'm embracing a kingdom mindset. Which what's, what's the kingdom? The rule and reign of God. I am in God now. God put me in Jesus, put me on the cross. The death he died, I died. The resurrection life he attained to, I do too now. I walk in newness of life. Old things pass away, all things become new. We now are walking in newness of life, and Hebrews says it's a new way of living. So let me tell you something. You, even to this day, you have old mindsets from the old life. Maybe something in school a teacher said got in there and never has been renewed. 
Something your mother said when you were five, something your dad said when you were 15, something your professor said when you were 20. Never got out of there. And so the devil with his lies and deceit, which is worldly wisdom, goes in there and builds on that mindset that you never repented of. And we've got him today. I've got him today. That's why Paul says, renew your mind daily. Get rid of these old mindsets. Take every thought captive to the obedience of the kingdom of God, not to what the world's saying to you. So I talk to my TV. When I got a talking head telling me something that's not kingdom, I say, that ain't true. There ain't no way that's true. I don't go there and park my brains out, you know, I don't, you know, outside the door of my house and then walk in there and say, fill me, Bill. Fill me, Glenn. I challenge what is being said to me through that TV. I match it with what the Word of God says, what the kingdom of God is. And when it don't line up, I don't believe that. And when I read something on Facebook religiously, which is 99.% religious, I go, so sad. So sad she thinks like that. So sad he thinks like that. And, you know, what are you going to do? I ain't going to correct him. It ain't my job to correct anybody on Facebook. Are you hearing me? Change the way you think or you cannot be in the kingdom. He said, if you put your hand to the plow and look back, you ain't worthy to be in the kingdom. He said, you ain't born again, you can't even see the kingdom. So being born again puts you in the kingdom. Does that make sense? Now, Wait, spent way too much time on that. Being born again. Everybody understand that? Now, what second second phase? What are you born again to? Well, it ain't going to look nothing like what you came out of. I want you to think today, what have I been born again to? I know what I've been born again from. I just look at my past life and think old things pass away, all things become new. So we're not going to talk about what we've been born again from. You all know that. What have why be born again? Well, you got to get into heaven. My God, that is so small thinking, narrow thinking. Yes, but I ain't it. What about now? eternal life started when you got born again. It doesn't start when you die. Otherwise, you really weren't saved. Being born again means it started, eternity started the day you got born again. So now start thinking eternal now. Not temporal, which is worldly, old things. Think eternal, which is kingdom thoughts, kingdom mindsets, kingdom truths. So you're born again to what? There is so much we're born again to and are not experiencing. Now, Jesus made this statement, on earth as it is in heaven. So God wants you to live a life on earth as it is in heaven, which means whatever is in heaven, you receive and you implement here on earth. So you get, so in other words, you have to receive what's in heaven before you can manifest it on earth. I can't manifest what I haven't received. And number one, I gotta know that it exists. Know what exists? I'm gonna tell you here in a minute. I gotta know that something in heaven exists that I have to receive in order to manifest it. Now, here's the question How much in your life can you say is heaven versus that's the world? When God had us pray on earth as it is in heaven, I want you right now to tell, to think, not tell me, but think about if you had to write down things in your life, what are the things that you know that thing came from heaven? That thing, I engaged the world and I got it, I engineered and orchestrated the world's way. That came from the world. I can't say God gave me that. My money bought me that. My desire got me that. But how much can you say in your life is a direct manifestation of heaven? Let me give you an example. This iPad. Woo, we got an iPad. I can't afford an iPad. This came from heaven. Because God, someone bought it, and as soon as they got it, God said, That's, that goes to Greg Lilly. 
Now, I can say this iPad came from heaven. Because it came to me by way of a supernatural means. It mean, which means this, I did not make that happen. Someone else made that happen. God spoke to someone and someone blessed me. Now, when someone blesses you, 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 didn't, you didn't ask them to, you didn't solicit them to. You know that came from God, right? So now you know what I'm talking about. What things came from heaven and what things God did not want you to have. And by God, you still wanted it and you made it happen and you got it. I told you all my jobs came from heaven. I don't know why. You know, some, some things God moves in your life supernaturally and in other people he does. But when it comes to jobs, I never sought out any of the jobs but one, and that's the one that was, came from hell and I had to get out of, which I learned a lesson from. But every other job came to me. And I knew they were from God. I didn't have to go out there and beg and plead and bar please and resumes and the world's way. I'm sorry, you know, people are like, wow, you got to go out there and make something happen. No, see, that's the doing mode. And in the kingdom, it's a receiving mode. So if you don't have a job right now and you're looking for one, this is, how you, this is how you get a job in the kingdom. You look to the Father and you receive what He has for you. And it gets manifested on this earth. And it's not you doing, it's you receiving and then manifesting it. What are we receiving? Now, Ephesians 1, turn there, verse 11. And we spent way too much time on that introduction. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says this. In Him, this is in Christ, we also were made God's heritage. That means we're God's possession. We're His portion. And we obtained what? What's it say that we obtained? An inheritance. An inheritance. You have to get inheritance minded from this day on. Everything in your life that comes from heaven is an inheritance. That's what we obtained when we got born again. So here's again. I'm born again, but what am I born again to? What's it say? An inheritance, right? So let me read it again. In him, we also, I'm reading this out of the Amplified, so it may not line up exactly with yours. In him, we also were made God's heritage portion, and we obtained an inheritance. For we had been foreordained, chosen, and appointed beforehand in accordance with his purpose, who works everything out in agreement with the counsel of the of the counsel and design of his own will. There's a lot there. But here's here's what Paul is basically saying. We were born again to an inheritance. And that inheritance, God wrote out, foreordained before you were created, before the foundations of the world, Re made ready for you to receive. Now Hebrews 12 talks about we are receiving a kingdom. We're always receiving the kingdom in our lives. So it's being manifested in the physical. So that inheritance is what we're born again to. So don't look at your job as just a job. Don't look at money as just money. Look at everything now through the lens of my inheritance. Now, how do you receive an inheritance? If somebody in your family dies, what they have, if, they're, if they've willed it to you, becomes an inheritance. And when you walk in that lawyer's office, what do you have to do with an inheritance? Huh? Accept. Receive it. Inheritances are free. And by the way, your government just taxed us on it. I used to be able to get a house from someone for free. Now i got to be taxed on it. Now most people can't afford the taxes to receive the gift that was given to them. God help us. Inheritance in the kingdom of God is not even taxed. You've got to pay for it. It's free. So let me ask you something. When it comes to you and God and the kingdom, what do you think you're working for? Someone, I, I put on Facebook 
Um, so I'll share a thing. The Bible's not a self-help book. And someone texted me, and she said, why isn't the Bible a self-help book? And that's sad that someone has to ask that. It's sad that you think that it is. And I just said to her, just look at the term. Let's look at the word self-help. Self-help. Self died on the cross with Christ. Jekyll can't fix Hyde. Jekyll can't read the Bible in order to fix Hyde. And that's what religion is. Law, steps, secret, keys to make you have a better life. You died to your life. The only way to have a better life now is to receive it. That's why it's called a finished work. Everything Jesus did on that cross is finished. And now he gives it to you freely by way of his life. I'm partaking of his life and manifesting it. I'm in him. I'm not living my... It's no longer I who lives. There is no such thing as self-help in Christianity. God, we got to get rid of that term. You're not going to find the Bible. Paul says, I put no confidence in the flesh. There's no, that terminology is foreign to Christianity. should be, but it isn't because Christianity became a self-help religion. We have an inheritance. So, it's, so that makes, if, if we have an inheritance and everything from heaven is an inheritance that gets manifested in my life, then I have to be in a receiving mode, not a doing mode. So that means if you want God to, if, you're, if you want whatever you want in life, it's not up to you. I don't have a choice what, what my inheritance is. I can't go to someone and say, put me in that will. I want your car. I want your garage. I want those, that, that estate. I want that house in the Hamptons. Definitely want the house in the Hamptons. I can't do that. I can't pick my inheritance. I receive what my inheritance is. So what is, it? What is my inheritance? Everything that Bible says is mine, is my inheritance. And whatever God tells me through, the, through his still small voice, what my inheritance is. This is why dreams, visions, and words you hear from God that aren't, don't come from the Bible, but they come from your relationship with God are so important because he's trying to tell you what your inheritance is and what you should start believing for. Or start receiving, getting in the receiving mode for. Is this making any... I mean, this is, this is good news. You don't got to work for anything in the kingdom. You receive it. Jesus did all the work. That's why it's called a finished work. And that's what an inheritance. We've obtained an inheritance. My healing's an inheritance. My deliverance is an inheritance. All right. But now that we're not, we're not going to get my message today. I was watching a guy on TV. Thought he was a grace preacher. Told people that he was a grace preacher. I think I told you about it the other day. And, and I thought, I can't even tell people to watch you now. And what he was saying was, now this is important because if, I want to get to dominion, but see, that's part of what we're to receive. Dominion. But if, there's no sense of talking about dominion if you don't know how to receive. If you don't even know what your inheritance is. And your inheritance is dominion. To walk in power and authority and dominion. That's part of your inheritance. But let's put that aside. This guy was saying that if you, for instance, if you have a problem with um, pornography, throw your computer out. Get rid, of your, get rid of your computer. And this is a grace guy. For three years he's been preaching grace. So he took a stupid pill today and says throw your computer out because you've got to do something. You've got to be able to do something until grace works. I don't know what that means, until grace works. But throw your computer out. He said, and if you go out and if you've got problems with cigarettes, he says, when you go out, don't take cash with you. Then you're not tempted to buy, as if he doesn't realize there's such thing as debit cards. I don't know. And I'm sitting there going, you got to be kidding me. Because in 1986, I'm 23 years old, and I preached grace better than he did then. And this is what I said. I remember this. You know why I remember this sermon vividly? I got hell for it. 23 years old at the church here in Fairmont. And I knew this was the beginning of the end of me being at that church because I was getting set free and they knew nothing of freedom. And I preached this message in 1986 at 23 years old. And I said, do you really think deliverance comes from? And here's what I said to them. 
I said, so, th so you say you're an alcoholic and you can't stop drinking. So what they would tell you to do and what this guy would tell you to do, he didn't say this, but it's the principle, is that, well, you can't go driving by that beer joint because if you drive by that beer joint, you're going to be tempted. So now, where it takes me 10 minutes to get home this way, it's going to take me 30 minutes to get home just so I don't have to drive by that beer joint. That's bondage. Because now I'm driving 30 minutes away. I'm doing something I don't want to do. So that trying to overcome alcoholism or drinking, because well, I can't drive by that, by that um, beer joint, I've got to go now 30 minutes out of my way Still dying for a drink that 30-minute drive. Listen, if you're still dying for a drink, you are not delivered. And there ain't nothing Jekyll can do to fix Hyde. See, that's Jekyll telling Hyde, let's, tr let's go another way around. And then, I, and, and then, of course, I say this now because I live in Clarksburg. So if I go to Food Line, my bread's right beside the beer. Guess I'll never eat bread again. Because it's by the beer. So I say to my wife, which I don't have one, but if I have, I say, honey, you got to go get, you got to go get the bread. I got everything else on that list, but I couldn't go down that aisle because there's beer in that aisle. That's not deliverance. That's not kingdom. That's, the, that's Jekyll trying to fix Hyde. That's psychology. That's what they would tell you. That's the hoops they tell you to jump, jump through. So what this man did who preaches grace told them to do I just said it. Told them what to do. Well, what do you do? Do you throw your computer out? Do you just... You don't do anything. That's the first thing. When it comes to an inheritance, you don't do anything. So rather throw your com computer out, you know what I say to you? Open, ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes that your deliverance has already happened. Don't drive a half an hour away, around. Just start open. Well, but I'll drink. You're going to drink anyway. I'm not giving anybody license to do anything except you're going to do it anyway until your eyes are open to what your inheritance is. You have to be in a receiving mode. You can't overcome sin by doing. You overcome sin by receiving what Jesus did on the cross. This is not, a, this is not an action thing. This is you having your eyes opened to what Jesus did and then boom, new drives come, new desires come. And guess what? You can drive by that beer joint. You can even walk buy it. You can go and look at the door next time. Actually, you, when you're truly delivered, you can open the damn door, look in there, and smell the beer. Smell the cigarettes. It ain't going to bother you. Because that's when you're truly delivered, and that's the kind of deliverance Jesus wants you to have, not one where you've got to fight it all the time. And you've got to admit you're an alcoholic, and you haven't had a drink in 30 years, and you're still calling yourself an alcoholic. <laughs> Honestly, that you, you can only overcome by receiving your inheritance, which causes you to overcome. I'm telling you, we are not supposed to be in a doing mode. We are in a receiving mode. You don't work for an inheritance. You receive an inheritance. And deliverance is your inheritance. But, you know... <coughs> And, and, and this person I was talking to, this is another person, and says, well, I said, well, smoke your cigarettes. And while you're smoking the cigarettes, study the Bible. Hell, I don't know what to tell you. You're going to smoke them anyway, but do something productive, kingdom-wise, while you're smoking. Start meditating on your inheritance. Meditate on the message of receive. What's it mean to receive? Receive, receive. Not, well, I've got to throw them away. And she said, yeah, because you know what just happened? I threw them away there last night, and here I am stressed out, and I'm on my way right now to a convenience store to get them. Yeah. What are you going to do? She so understand the receiving mode versus the doing mode? Yeah. The Old Testament's doing. And Jesus said, did you not learn anything? That's the purpose why I gave you the law. Doing never caught. Doing doesn't change Jekyll <coughs> to Hyde or whatever. And, and really... Why do, who's Jekyll to make Hyde like him? You both are going to hell because you both are the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Got to be born again. Jekyll has to die as well as Hyde. And a new man is what we're looking for, not a reformed Jekyll or reformed Hyde. We're looking for a new man. We're born again. New man. New creation. All right, let's move on. Uh, way too much. So do you understand... The, 
what an inheritance is then? Everything the Bible says is yours is an inheritance. And you don't work for it, you receive it. I know that's too simple. You want that list, that do, you know, six steps. Okay, let's look at the origin of dominion because that's where I want to go at real quick. And then I'm going to close. We, our inheritance is to be born again, right? That's the first inheritance. You've got to be born again. And then it is to be, and there's all those, but here's the, the, the inheritance, dominion. And here's the origin of it. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and the cattle and over all the earth and everything creeping that creeps on the earth. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over it. Now, and it goes on and tells you some more things. But I want you to see those words, dominion and subdue what? The earth. That's our, her that's our inheritance. This earth is our inheritance. You understand that? Now, let me show you something here. The Hebrew word for subdue, because remember we tried to figure that out the other time we were here? The Hebrew word subdue means to bring into subjection. Who's supposed to bring things into subjection? Who, well, let me just jump up here. Psalms 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So who does the earth belong to? The Lord. And who did he give dominion to? Okay, now look at Psalms 115, 16. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. So why, why have we given the earth over to communism, socialism? Why has people given the earth over to dictators, to their philosophies, to their ideologies? When... Do they have a right to? Yeah. Sure they do. But we're on this earth as God's children. The earth belongs to God. So who should have the dominion on the earth? The lost or the saved? This is the mentality David had when he faced Goliath. He said, he looked at Goliath. And remember, no one would fight Goliath for how many days? And the, and the armies were at a standstill. David comes down and says, this, guys, this is a no-brainer. I don't understand why you are at a standstill. It's the Republicans against the Democrats. It's the, it's the Libertarians against the Republicans. It's the Conservatives against the Liberals. I don't understand this. We're kingdom people. And he's uncircumcised. That's the no-brainer here. Who wins this battle? We do. He's uncircumcised. We're the ones who have a covenant with God. He doesn't serve our God. And the earth is the Lord's. And we are the Lord's heritage portion. We saw that in Ephesians. And he's given the, the earth to us. Why are we letting him win? He's coming down today. I'll go do it. See, and we look at these governments and we look at these other kingdoms of this world and we go, oh my God, they got all the money, they got all the power. No, they don't. Because in Haggai, it says the gold and the silver are God's, not theirs. And when uh, you can, George Sorosis or Sorosis of the liver George, whatever you call him, I want his money. I'll even take Warren Buffett's money. <laughs> because the Bible says the wealth of the wicked has been laid up for the righteous. That's not their money. Haggai says the gold and the silver are mine. That's what God says. And if I'm a child of God, that gold and silver is my inheritance. And this is where we go when we get the money down the road. I don't work for money. Money works for me. I don't serve money. Money comes to me. I need to now know how to take dominion over money. But the world wants you to work for money, not have a mentality of, I own money. I, I'll call money in. I know, you, 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 can't, you, you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, that's, that's fantasy world. No, it ain't. This is, this is, that's the mindset in you. What is in you? After, when it comes to this kind of thing, money, oh, well, you rather work for that minimum wage, wouldn't you? Those peanuts that boss wants to pay you. When you know you work harder than what she or he pays you. 
I'm telling you, here's the way out. Look at that job as your mission field. That's it. You, you know, yeah, I'll just take your money and sow it. But I'm, I rule over money. I'm calling money in you know nothing of. And, P, and what it ought to look like is, how in the world do you, how do you live like this making the money you make? Well, number one, I don't make a living. You do. I don't. I'm a servant and the son of God, and I'm down here working for my father in the kingdom and I don't really work for him. I'm on a mission to do what he tells me to do. And I'm in this job. As this job is my mission field. Anyway, we'll get into more of that. It's just a, you see the, the switch in thinking? This is, this is liberating. This tells whoa, whoa, wait a minute, man. This, I am not who I thought I was. On my job, in my family, in this world, I am a son of God. My identity is nothing like they have been telling me. See, that passed away. They keep trying to put that old identity on me that's passed away. i got to find out what it means to be a son of God, find out my new identity, and what my inheritance is. And buddy, I'm walking it out. Hell or high water, I am walking this thing out. I will advance the kingdom of God, not depend on the world or... Keep looking to the world. I'm advancing the kingdom, not the world. So let's look at the word subdue now. So now we know the earth is ours. What's this word subdue mean that he told Adam to do? To bring into subjection. So I may not have control right now over certain entities and, and things, but I know one thing I am to have dominion over is my life, my house, my affairs. I am going to bring them into subjection to the kingdom of God. I'm going to look at what the world brought in, and I'm going to say, no, I'm going to bind loose because I've got the kingdom keys, the keys to the kingdom to do that, and I'm going to advance the kingdom with the keys God gave me to advance the kingdom with. So subjection, bring it into subjection to enslave. This is what he told Adam, bring this earth into subjection. <coughs> enslave it to God's will, to, the kingdom, to, the, to heaven. Dominion means to tread down. As in a wine press, to subjugate, subdue, to crumble, oppress, to walk on a person. That's part of the definition in the, in the Hebrew, to walk on a person. And the reason why that's so important to the Hebrew, to the Old Covenant, was they literally, had, the king would put his, 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 his foot on another king's neck. After he, after he whooped him and took, took his city, he would put his foot on the king's neck to let him know how he just conquered him. And then he cut his head off. To rule, to reign, to prevail against, to take. That's what you're called to do. You're called to tread, to subdue, to oppress, to rule, to reign, to prevail, to take. To take. Find out what's yours and take it. That's what it means to subdue. So God's original plan for man, which is part of his inheritance, is to subdue, to take dominion. So we're born to reign. Born again. What am I born again to? I'm born again to reign and take the earth and not let the enemy have it. To subdue it. Well, how do I do that? I, I ain't talking about how. There's no sense of talking about how to do it until you understand that that's your inheritance to do. Next week we're going to talk about how to have dominion. But today I just want you to be aware that you are born again to take dominion. You, your language has to change. Do you think that the king's language, the way a king's, the king talks, is different from the way a servant talks? Because here how, here's how a king talks. He decrees things. He declares things. He talks with power. He talks with authority. A servant doesn't talk like that. Because someone says, who the hell are you? You ain't nobody. And they put him right, back, right in his place. He is a nobody. He's a peasant. So he, his language... It's going to be different than the king's language, right? You ever, you ever been around somebody who's, um, say, more educated than you? And they use words you don't understand? And their thought patterns and the way they think? It's like, okay, I, I, I'm lost. Doesn't mean they're better than you. It's just that they're, they're, they talk different. They think different. And you have, and you can't relate to that person, right? See, so can a king relate to a servant? 
Or can a servant relate to a king? Too big of a difference between the two. So kings don't hang out with servants and servants don't hang out with kings. In fact, the servants has their servants' quarters. And the king and his family, whose royalty, stays in the palace. I'm saying we have been servants to this world, slaves to this world, and we've been talking like this world when we say, well, we find out who we are. Wait a minute. My language changes. I don't beg God. I don't plead with God. I don't barter with God. I am an ambassador of God. I echo what God says. I advance what my inheritance. I receive my inheritance and I advance the kingdom of God with it. My language now is not one of begging and pleading, but one of, if what you're saying, if I'm born again to dominion, and for instance, um, Revelation 5 talks that we are kings on this earth. Romans 5 says we are to reign on earth as kings. And Revelation 3, the church of Laodicea at the very end says that we share a throne with God. And if you're going to share a throne, that makes you a king too. So we're called kings. Why don't we talk like a king? We need to talk like we have power and authority and dominion. And we don't. When sickness comes, listen to your language. When you don't have enough money to pay your bills, listen to your language. Listen to the stuff that comes out of your mouth. It's you in the servant's quarters talking like a servant. If I have power and authority over everything on this earth, that includes money, then my mentality with money and paying bills have got to change. Or I'm not receiving from the kingdom. I'm going to keep receiving the crumbs from the world. And same thing with sickness. You know what we say? Oh, I'm getting old. That, that old back. Oh, my back. Well, you know, that comes with old age, brother. What do you say? How, why, why do we talk like that? No, honestly. Why do we talk like that? When I show you in the Bible that God renews my youth like the eagles. But, oh, no, no, I can't, I can't line up my thoughts with God and confess and believe and take dominion over this body and say, you will not get old like that. It says Moses was 120 years old, and it says his eyesight didn't even grow dim. It says he was perfectly healthy. And you take Caleb. He's 80 years old. And he says, I am as young today. This is what he says. I'm as strong today at 80 as I was when I was 40. Let's go take this land. He didn't go, oh, 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 man. Wow. I can't do that. <laughs> I'm not the 40-year-old guy I used to be. I need help. I'm 80. The, the big thing now is dementia. I'm going to tell you right now, I am going to be sharp as a tack when I'm 80, 90 years old. I am not going to sit there feeble-minded, can't get around, and slobbering out the side of my mouth and my kids are changing my diapers. Hell no to that. And I'm not being funny. I have the power and authority to say hell no to that. And that will not be my lot in life. Amen. And I'm not going to sit there, well, you know, you're getting older. Look at so-and-so. Look, look what happened to him. I don't know why it happened to him. And I'm not concerned. I know what the Bible says about me, not by what happened to him. Maybe he didn't understand his covenant that he had with God. People are, people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, the Bible says. I mean, I got all these. You know what? I'm not going to go through all these because, but you can email me or ask. And I'll, I'll just give you these. I'll just send you these. All these are all I have for you today was dominion scriptures. And there are so many scriptures that I really could have, you know, binding and loosening, you know, shared throne, kings on this earth. What else we got here? The Lord established his throne, Psalms 103, in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. God's kingdom, heaven, rules over all. And we are his children. We are his sons and daughters. That makes us the rulers over all. Romans 8, 17, Isaiah 45. I mean, there's just, I just got them coming out the wazoo here. And I don't understand why we're not walking in it. 
That's why I was going to take this time, but I'm not going to. You, if you really want to know this, you can email me. It's all here. All of the scriptures, and you can meditate on these things. But I want you to see today, most of all, what you have been born again to. Not to be a puppet to somebody. Not to be a, a servant to a, a government. Not to be a servant to anybody. And not to depend on that. I, I, I believe in government. Limited government to protect me and make, make sure things operate on a smooth level here. But not to infringe on my freedom or my creativity or my right to speak, my right to own guns, my right to property, my right to have, my, my right to smoke pot if I want to. Do you understand that? Not that I want to. I'm simply saying, you know what? Here, here's, how you, here's how you kill the gay marriage thing. Get the government out of the marriage and we don't have a problem. You want to marry a guy? Have at it, man. That's what makes your boat float? Sail. But, but we got to make it a big thing here because the government gets involved in people's lives. I don't think I should legislate how somebody lives. They, I, I preach freedom. Is that not what I preach? So therefore, when you preach freedom, people have the right to choose, to do with their bodies what they want to do with them, to marry who they want to marry, I mean, I never worried about these guys, these hillbillies in the hills with goats. I never worried about that. That never concerned me. But if the government wants to make an issue about it and legislate it, now that's going to start concerning me. Yeah. Now I got a, I got a guy coming in here wanting to me marry. He wants to marry a goat. He was raised with it. It's been around him since he was five. He's fallen in love with it. I'm not going to marry him and a goat. Now I, well, you got to. Now it becomes an issue for me. Because you're going to try to make me do something that I don't have. If I don't want to bake a cake and I don't want to give out flowers, I don't have to do anything. You have the right to go down the street and get your baked cake by somebody else and flowers to do your wedding. Uh, yeah, yeah, where's the freedom? I'm not legislating your morality, and by God, you ain't legislating my morality. Ain't going to happen. So here's the dominion. I'm standing up for what I believe. And you can do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. And I'm exercising dominion though. I'm not doing it to be a jerk. You understand there's a difference. I'm not trying to rule people. I'm trying to get my inheritance. And whatever transformations and new drives and desires God puts within me. Be faithful to those. So I'm not compromising because you're trying to make me. And then I'm advancing my life here on earth. I'm here. You got to you got to deal with me, and you're not changing me. See, I don't have an agenda. Most people have an agenda, and they want me to accept everything they believe and want. And this is I'm saying. Well, you getting political? How do you? How can you not? This is life. We live in this world. Yeah, I'm getting political here. Because I'm here, and I have a right. My voice is just as much right as Al Sharpton's voice. And what you're trying to peddle on me, I, I'm peddling my thing. You pedal, and let's let the folks decide what, what truth they want to believe. Let's not legislate anything. Let's let people choose what they believe to be truth, and then have the freedom to live that truth out. But until then, I, I love the flag. Don't tread on me, man. And I think we've got to resurrect that as a church. Don't you tread on me because part of my dominion is me treading on you. Not taking you over, but bringing the kingdom of God in love. I mean, I've got your deliverance. I have a message. The kingdom message is Christ has forgiven you. God loves you. And you can live your life however you want. But God, know this. God loves you and died for you. That's how I... You know, but you're, you're not, when you're in my area, I'm treading on you. You're in my world, I'm subduing it. And you're getting subdued too if you're in my world. Now, can you imagine if everybody that's saved, born again, I'm talking about even those that are in the ecumenical movement. I'm talking about the Catholics. I'm talking about the Methodists. I'm talking about the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Episcopalians and all those other that just are just religious. If you can get everybody that claims to believe in God 
and they get this dominion message, there ain't a, there ain't a ideology out there that's anti-Christ that has a chance. Take dominion. Now, there's all sorts of ways, and we'll talk about this in the weeks to come, how you take dominion. How, you, how do you take dominion at a job when you're not the boss? How do you take dominion over money when you don't have enough to spend at the end of the, enough to pay the bills? How do you take dominion over a marriage? How do you take re dominion over rebellious teenagers? If we're supposed to have dominion, how do I exercise my power and authority? He says, I've given you keys to the kingdom. How do we use these keys? And how do they affect different areas of our life, which we'll talk about in the weeks to come. But what you understand, what you understand what you're born again to, you have received kingship. The scepter has been placed in your hands to decree and declare, to take, to subdue, to tread. Everywhere the sole of your foot treads, he's given it to you. Now we living like kings with dominion. Have, have we received that? You can't walk in what you haven't received. Many of you have been given the scepter, but you haven't picked it up. You're not ruling and reigning. You're trusting the world to take care of you. You're trusting that the world will just be nice to me today. You trust that maybe you vote differently. The next president might make your life a little better. Oh, no, no, no. Do you understand? When you understand what I'm talking about, you are the answer to your conflict. Not a government. Not a person. You're the answer to every conflict in your life. Because you have dominion to bind and to loose. I'm telling you, where we're going is going to turn your world upside down. These series of messages are a game changer if you believe what I'm saying. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Father, I, I, I want my life changed. I, I don't want to live like the, the, the religious church. I want to live like Jesus lived. I want to walk in power and authority. And I want my inheritance. Whatever Jesus died for and whatever this inheritance is, which we know is in the Bible, but everything else God speaks to me is my inheritance. I want what Christ purchased for me. I want to know what my inheritance is so I can receive it and then manifest it on earth in power and authority and dominion. I cannot take dominion over my life if I don't know what my inheritance is, what am I be doing? Just throwing around power and authority? I have to have a purpose. I got to know what I'm about. And that's opening our eyes to our inheritance. God has a specific plan, a destiny, if you will. That's your inheritance. And once you understand what it is, you take power and authority and you begin to decree it and declare it on this earth. That inheritance is not supposed to be up there in heaven waiting for you when you get there on the other side. It's for now on earth as it is in heaven. You could say it like this. On earth according to my inheritance. That's a good way of saying it. On earth according to my inheritance. So Lord, open my eyes to my inheritance so I can receive it and then begin to manifest it. And that's on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I pray that you open the eyes of the church. We are not walking out our destinies. We're not the light and we're not the salt. The government has become the light. Governments have become salt. God never called the government light and salt. He called individual people light and salt. He called the church light and salt. Everywhere you go, you're light. And, you're, and you are a representative of the kingdom of God. Now, are you walking in your inheritance as light, as salt? Or are you walking around like a pauper, a poor, destitute, just get by person? Don't know where I'm going. Don't know what life's about. And I'll just take the crumbs people offer to me. No. You have been delivered from the servants' quarters and you have been given a place in the king's chamber, in the king's castle, at his table, to rule and reign with him. We have to repent. 
meaning change the way we think. We've got to change the way we think and make a complete 180 and go the other direction and be who God called us to be. Walk out our inheritance. We're not trusting, Jekyll's not trusting Hyde to get his act together. We're a new man walking this out. Old things passed away, all things become new. That's your inheritance. Find out what it is. Start seeking God, Look, read the Bible, find out what the Bible says is yours. Do a concordance search on the word receive and find out all the scriptures that tells you what you can receive. Meditate on those words and get your mind renewed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget to sow in the word this morning. We'll see you next week.